see. Um, last time we were talking about how God uses processes uh, that he designed to accomplish uh, his work in the world. And, um, uh, and, and then once those processes are in place, uh, he is not going to manipulate them. Uh, and, and so don't forget why we're looking at these addendums. I, I, I'm just reminding what we did last time because we're talking about the office of mercy and the proper way to discharge it. And because uh, the godly function of the office of mercy results in helping the fellow saints who are suffering in some way. And that, that suffering may be spiritual or it may be physical in nature, uh, but we can view the discharge of that office. Um, we can actually take all of that back to the Lord because he has de designed that himself. So when it comes to God's intervention, I know these are honest questions, and so I want to answer them. And so let me see if I can go through this material. And again, you will have the interactive learning if you have a question, but um, I need to get through this today. I don't want to stretch. This addendum is going to go to E. We're in C today. I don't want it to go to F. So I'm trying to get through this today. So when it comes to God intervening, there are several views of that. And I want to take a look at them. The, the first one is what I'm calling the sovereign view. Uh, let me get rid of that. The sovereign view. And uh, Calvinists hold to this and, 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 some, and some others. And, the, and this is a, a, theo a theological uh, view that sees God superintending, orchestrating, and controlling every single event that happens down to the smallest detail. Everything. Not just the good stuff. Everything. Because, uh, and, well, I'll talk about the because there in just a second. And so what the, the idea is that in order for God to be in control of his creation, he has to control every single aspect of it. But I really question that. Is that really the case? Um, in order for him to be in control of his creation, does he really need to control every single aspect? And when I talk about every single aspect, I'm talking about the clothes you put on today, God is the one that designed that. Which shoe you put on first, God designed uh, how that would happen. Um, it, rather, re what time you got here, that was in God's design. And you understand that if you believe that, and I don't, but if you believe that, there is no such thing as free will because God is controlling every detail. And so... To the folks that believe the sovereign view, God is, it, there, it, it, God is one big intervention from beginning to end. That's the way they, they see that. And one of the things, and, 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 and I said I would come back to this, and that is um, people think in order for God to be sovereign, in order for God to be in control of his creation, he has to be able to control all of those details. But I'm going to show you something from the scripture that I think is an exception to that. So let's look together at 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. We're looking at the qualifications of a bishop. And so take a look at this with me. 1 Timothy 3, 1. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. One that ruleth well his own house having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? I want to take that phrase that I bolded for you, having his children in subjection. When we look at what that word uh, entails, here's what we come up with. It's the act, state, or fact of exercising lordship or control. And then there's a semicolon. You get this. Dominion, domination, control. And so take that back to that verse now. Having his children under subjection or in control 
of his children. But in order for a father to be in control of his children, does he have to micromanage every single detail of their life? I mean, does he have to decide how full their cereal bowl is? I mean, does he have to, does he have to manage how much milk they pour on it or whether or not they get a second helping at dinner? Does he really have to uh, dictate which shoe they put on first and uh, all of that? See, I'm just saying, can a, can a bishop meet this qualification without micromanaging every detail of his children's lives? Yes, and I believe our Heavenly Father can be in control of his creation without micromanaging every detail of the lives of people on the earth. Now, I, there is certainly more to say about it, and I know that's a very simplistic way to look at that, but this sovereign view is one that you need to be aware of, and, um, and, and so we're looking at, and by the way, we're looking at these because we want to understand what it is that God is doing today. All right, so we look at that, and uh, the next view is the hands-off view. This view has a couple of components to it. The first one says God has given us his word and he's given us his spirit. And then the only thing, and then God is hands off. He doesn't have anything to do with it. And everything that happens to us is either by chance or luck. And I want to talk to you about this view for a moment because... The people who subscribe to this view see chance and luck as actual entities that can make things happen. Now, so I have two problems with this view. First of all, I do believe that God gave us his word and gave us his spirit. I do not believe he is hands off. The second issue is chance and luck have no ability to determine anything. They cannot manipulate a, a situation or determine an outcome. So I think that that is a mistake, and I, I don't believe the Scripture would support that a, at all. And so uh, I, I do, however, and we'll talk about this in a different in one of the other views in just a moment. Um, but I but I do believe that God is involved. The way in which he is involved is going to be the subject of the fourth view uh, when we get to that. The next view is the in and out view. And the in and out view says this. Um, sometimes God intervenes and sometimes he doesn't. That's convenient, isn't it? Uh, and you have to say it that way. Uh, look, uh, yeah, what people are doing is they're looking at the circumstances. They're trying to come up with something that kind of fits those circumstances. But understand that this, when you're talking about the law, when you're talking about living in a time when God is dealing with everyone under the performance system of the law, then you know what you get? You get different things happening. Sometimes you get the blessing, but that would be because you were walking after that law and keeping his commandments and all that. Sometimes, though, you did not get those blessings. You got the curses. Again, that was part of the performance contract. Uh, and, and, and all of that was for a purpose, by the way. But when we, you come into this dispensation of Gentile grace, where God is working with us Gentiles, not through the agency of Israel, which is all part of their program, but apart and separate. Actually, you could say, in spite of Israel, God is working with us Gentiles. And Paul talks about that being a dispensation of grace. I'm not saying grace never appeared back in Israel's program, but... But that program was run, by and large, under the law contract. Under, under the, and, and when, there, when grace is the feature by which God is dealing with us today, there is no law. 
There is no performance contract that dictates how God will deal with us. So I'm just so I'm going to say to you this, and it's a principle. We'll have to discuss the detail of it later uh, because it got too big in here. But when you're talking about God dispensing things by his grace, this is the important principle to remember. If God is doing it all by grace, what he does for one member, he will do for all members. That is correct. Here's the second thing you need to know. And if God is going to do something in this circumstance, he will do that every time in that circumstance. So people don't get treated differently under grace. God's not picking and choosing winners and losers. So what he is doing is he is saying, I'm going to give it to you out of the out of my grace and my goodness and I'm going to give it to you not because you deserve it but because I'm giving it to you and so and, and, and so just to say it that way if you can get those two principles in your mind you will be able to readily identify what God is and is not doing so if if you're riding along in your car you're riding along in your car and it looks like you're almost out of gas and you, you've got a ways to go to the station. In the old days, here's what I did. I prayed for God to let me get to the station and not run out of gas. I didn't tell him how to do it. I just felt like I could ask him and maybe he would let me get there. And you know what? And if I got there, you know what I thought? God answered my prayer. But, when, but it, when I ran out and I didn't get there, then here, here's what I thought. Well, he just said no. That's how that worked, right? Now, that's a scheme that, you, that cannot fail. You know, we've invented a scheme here that that's how. But here's the thing. If I had understood grace properly, I would have understood that if God would have done that for me one time, he would also do it for me the next time. Not only that, if God would do that for Richard, then he would also do it for Linda and Barbara. Because God is not great. That's, that's, that is the means by which God is dealing with us today out of his grace. So those two things really help you uh, get a hold of that. There's one more thing I want to say about this, and we're going to kind of come back to this view a little bit later uh, because there's something about it that I want to pick up on, but, but it'll be under the, a different heading. But what I want to say is if we have, if God is sometimes doing it and sometimes not, and he's doing it for some people but not doing it for other people, and by the way, I would, I, you know what, I really tried to think about, is there anything in Paul's epistles that indicates to me that God is playing favorites and is going to do it for this person or this group, but is not offering that to, to someone else? Everything that he did when he put us in Christ, he did for everybody. Everything that he is offering us as part of our edification, he is offering to everyone. And it's equally that way. And so I really don't find that principle in Paul's epistles that in this dispensation of grace, God is working with us, you know, kind of sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. Here's another problem with that, and this is where I wanted to go with that. That makes it really hard to, to know if God is going to do it or not, right? If sometimes he does and sometimes he doesn't. So look, I'm, I, I don't want to uh, treat this flippantly. 
But I have, I have, I have known people who believed with all of their heart that God was faithful. They ran into a circumstance in which they uh, financially became destitute. Um, I don't want to say too much about this, uh, but I'm trying to give you a, the picture of it. So destitute financially that when every once in a while a little money would make its way in to the family and they actually got to sit down and eat a meal, it was a little bit uncomfortable and even hurt because they weren't used to having food in their stomach. Now, I know what they were saying in the midst of that. God is faithful. Because that's what you're supposed to say. But you have to ask yourself, why in the world, if God loves them and you know, really cares about that, why would he not have at least provided food in its minimal supply for them and other things? I, my answer to that is, is because God's not intervening in that way by means of his omnipotent power. If he is, then you know what he's doing? He's picking and choosing. And if he's picking and choosing, then you have to ask yourself the question, based on what? And that gives people the ability to charge God with capriciousness. He's just, there is no real rhyme or reason to it. There's no logic behind it. There's no system you can identify he just, if he just kind of feels like it, maybe I'll do it today. And if I don't feel like it, I won't do it tomorrow. That makes for an unfaithful God. That makes for a God that you cannot depend on. And God is not unfaithful. He is not undependable. So you know where the problem is? The problem is not with God the problem is with our understanding of what he is doing. That's where the problem is. And we say he can do anything, and we interpret events as though, but there are some things in this world we just absolutely know he's not going to do. I've mentioned these before. I'll mention one to you, and then we're going to move on. I talked about sometimes when I'm, I see I'm, I forgot to fill up, and I'm long gas. I got a ways to get to a gas station. I'm hoping I could get to the gas station those days. I would pray that God would let me get to the gas station. There were, there, were, there were some times that I came out, and I had a leak in a tire, and the tire was down, and then you know what I'm praying? God, let me get to a place where I can air it up because I didn't have a compressor at home, and so I got to get to a place that I can do that. You know what was always Murphy's Law? The first station I come to, their air's not working. And it does, happens all the time. And then you know what? Oh, God, please let me get to the next station. Okay. <laughs> so Murphy's Law is prevalent, right? So, but if I came out and that tire was flat on the ground, even though I serve a God who can do anything, I never asked him to air it up. And do you know why? Because he is not going to. Is it because he doesn't have the power? No. No. It's because that's not what he's doing. So you know what? Sometimes I make it to the air pump and sometimes I don't. Sometimes I make it to the gas station and sometimes I don't. But guess what? It works the same way for a lost guy. I'm just trying to give us a solid picture here of what this in and out view is. It's very disconcerting. 
And I think it allows us to charge God with folly. And God is not foolish at all. Here's the last one. It is the God working in us view. And this one I do subscribe to, and I have some verses to give us on this. And you know what they are, so they'll be familiar to you. But in Philippians chapter 2 and in verse 13, take a look. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Look, the Spirit is in us. His word is designed to effectually work how? In us. And when, when we encounter God's word and we understand it and, and, and the spirit, and as we begin to, to respond positively and properly to that word, and you understand the difference between those, a positive response to that word is that we I mean, I could do the whole thing here. We hear it, uh, we understand it, and we believe it. But just because you believe something doesn't mean you're actually implementing it into your life. And so that's the positive response. The proper response is when we begin now to implement that doctrine into our lives what we understood that and when we began to do that then what that spirit does is he takes that word and he begins to work it in our inner man and he begins to transform us and conform us to the image of his son and that's what Paul calls the effectual working of the word and folks that happens in us now there's another verse that I want to show you in fact several verses I want to make some comments about them and they're not in your notes because I'd already printed your notes by the time I decided to include these. And so here they are. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. So you can look at it here on the PowerPoint. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. Because when you received the word of God which you heard of us. You received it not as the word of men. But as it is in truth the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. That word, that's just the verse to substantiate what I just got through saying, that that word works in us. And what is that word working to do? How about Galatians 4.19, my little children of whom I travail in birth again, until Christ be formed in you. The effectual working of that word actually now forms Christ in us it, it's one of a number of ways that the Bible talks about that process and by the way that is what Paul was constantly working toward with every assembly not just with the Galatians Roman uh, Romans 8 11. but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you a couple of things to know about this number one that word dwell is more than just the fact that he is in there but the fact that he is dwelling in there carries that additional meaning that he is actually now has the freedom and liberty to because of our positive and proper response to the word to actually now effectually work in our inner man to change us from the inside. That's what this, that, when the Spirit has the ability to do that, th think of this. It, if you're in someone else's house, you, you don't go in and decide what pictures are going up and rearrange the furniture and change these dishes to this cabinet. No, but where you live, where, where it's really yours and you have the freedom to make those kinds of decisions, you decide what goes on the wall. You decide where the, what drawer the silverware is in. And you decide where things are kept. That's part of the dwelling. Uh, in, uh, as we just live in a place. But when the spirit is dwelling in us. Then he has the ability to hang the pictures on the wall. 
and decide what drawer the silverware is going in, so to speak. You understand what I'm saying? In, in relation to the work that he has been designed to do in our inner man, that work that conforms us to the image of God's son. And, and, and so the first thing I wanted to point out was this issue of d d dwell. So when you look at that, for if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, then there's going to be a result of the Spirit doing that. Here's that result. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. What does it mean to quicken your mortal bodies? Well, we usually think of the word quicken means make, to make alive. But actually, and we've done this work before, that word quicken means to rouse to fullness of function. Because you can be alive and in a coma. You can be alive but not really functioning very well. But to quicken means to rouse to fullness of function. And look what he says here. Quicken your mortal bodies. Why mortal bodies? Well, first of all, they're not yet redeemed, so they are destined to die. They are mortal bodies. But in that mortal body, guess what? The life of Jesus Christ himself can be made manifest in that because of what? It's not a, the wave of a magic wand that suddenly God makes you spiritual. It is a result of what's been happening in your inner man that is now being made manifest in your, by your outer man. In other words, it's, it, it is the the fruit of what's been going on in you. Because if, the, if, if that work is not going on in us, then you know what? Then the Spirit isn't dwelling. He's not able to do the things that He wants to do. He's there. You ever read those verses about over there about quench not the Spirit? Grieve not the Spirit? Is it possible to have him but not let him do what he wants to do? Of course it is. But when he is able to do that, he'll quicken that mortal body by, the, by producing the life of Jesus Christ in us. That's the fullness of function. And so that takes me to Philippians 1.6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. I'm not going to, you know what, I started to go back and run all the references and show you all of this. But again, it just made this thing way too long. So let me just say it this. That good work, I just want you to know, is he who hath begun a good work in you. In you. The work is not around you or in close proximity. It's in you. Everything else comes out of that. And he, says, and he says to the Philippians, and by extension, the body of Christ all over, he says, I'm confident that he has had begun a good work in you, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And in a nutshell, the day of Jesus Christ is the blessed hope, or what people call the rapture, and guess what happens at that event? You get a glorified body. So then you don't have to worry about that mortal body anymore. Now you'll have that glorified body. So he said, and so when, when is this work going to get done? It's going to get done from whenever you start until you get your new body. If you're alive at the coming of the Lord. All right. So, um... And so that so so let me just kind of read through this because I want you to understand the the focus is on the inner man issue. And so here it is. He began that work in us. He began that work in us when he placed us in Christ. Spiritual thing or physical thing? That's a spiritual thing when he placed us in Christ. He also gave us his spirit that is a spiritual thing. He also designed his work to work in our inner man. And that's a spiritual issue. He gave us a new identity in Christ. 
didn't change the way we look, didn't change our family name, but that's a spiritual issue that happened in us. He also performed the circumcision made without hands. And, and I got, as soon as I put that down there, I thought I have to say at least a word about that because every body has three parts to them, body, soul, and spirit. And when you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, what he did is he cut loose that body of flesh from your soul and spirit so that no matter what you do in your body, it does not affect what he has done with regard to your soul and spirit. So when you, got, when you trusted Christ, you know what he made? He made you to be the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a question. You ever done anything unrighteous since you got saved? But here's the good news. God knew that, and so he performs that circumcision made without hands. This is the spiritual circumcision that cuts our soul and spirit loose from the body of flesh so that even though we're not doing what we're supposed to do, our standing before God is unchanged and we're still righteous in his sight. Oh, I see Ruby. Thank you. Ruby's got her hands together going like, thank you, God, for that. And I'm right there with her. And you know what that is? That's something that when he, look, remember the sentence, when he began this work in you, all of these things that I'm talking about, about giving us his spirit, and, 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 and now the spiritual circumstance, all, is, all of these are inner man issues. And um, right, so let me, uh, uh, so, so let me move on. And he, uh, oh, and then he gives us a sanctification whereby we can live for him in the details of our lives. What do I mean by that? In the everyday, workaday life of going about your business, you can live for God in a way that is absolutely, totally acceptable to Him. Because it comes out of something He provided and gave you as a free gift of grace when you trusted His Son as your all-sufficient Savior. So He did all those things when He began that work and now what I want to say is he continues that work when he does this. When he, as he continues to form Christ in us. In, and, that, and folks, that also is an inner man issue. That's a spiritual issue. And, he, and, and, and by that working of the word, he is constantly conforming us to the image of his son and that is a spiritual thing as well and then and by that that constant conforming he is working to bring us unto or to make us a perfect man and when he's saying perfect there he's not talking about you never do anything wrong. You never make a bad judgment. You never make a mistake. He is talking about a perfect man in the sense of completeness. That this work that he started actually has the ability to be accomplished in you and completed in you and bring you to being that perfect man. And folks, that's, and that's a spiritual thing too. And all of these things that I have talked to you about, listen carefully, all of these things I've talked to you about, and put them all on the board. But every one of those things are way more valuable than intervening in the physical affairs of your life. Every one of them. Any one of them. Now I know when we don't, when we don't see that for what it is, We'd rather make it to the gas station. And, and, and nobody wants to run out of gas. By the way, don't go out and run out of gas on purpose so now I'm suffering with Christ. No. C 
Colossians 1.27. So here we go. To whom would God, God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. What are we doing? I'm trying to show you. You want to know how God's intervening? He's intervening in us. In us. And it's a huge endeavor. Don't, don't think it's not a big deal or it's not important. It's a huge big deal. He's, in fact, he's been waiting to do this. It's what he could not do with Israel. They did plenty of miracles for Israel. Guess what? It didn't edify them unto godliness at all. God performs all those miracles while they're in the land of Egypt, and they come out with all the riches of Egypt, and when they get to the Red Sea, what do they start doing? Whining about how they miss it in Egypt. They're children. You are sons and daughters, and God is giving you something vastly superior, or to use the Bible term, more excellent. And so what is, that, what is that mystery of godliness? It's Christ in us. It's him living our life in us, in our fleshly mortal bodies. They're not even redeemed yet. And so we get to Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell where? In you. I'm just, I'm just trying to show you the preponderance of, of the verses are, are demonstrating that in this dispensation of grace, God is working, his desire is to work in us to produce something eternal in nature and not temporal and not physical. And by the way, there's that word dwelling in there. Let the word of Christ dwell in you. Let that word have its free course to do what it was designed to do. All of this is to make that point that he is working in our inner man. And by the way, all of that is an expression of the power. That, look. The power of his grace. I know everybody wants to look at God's omnipotence. He has the power to do this, the power to do that. He has the power to create. He has the power. Uh, he, he can part the Red Sea. He can, he, he, he can take loaves and fishes and feed thousands. All of that's his omnipotence. What we're talking about now is the power of his grace, which I believe is the greatest power God possesses. And the reason I think that is because Paul calls this the excellency of his power. What? The excellency of his power. That root word is excel. It surpasses every other power God possesses. And guess what? The power of his grace is the power of that works in you. Why would you want to settle for dabbling in the arrangement of physical circumstances when you could have the life of Christ generated in your mortal body? That's, the, that's what living out of grace is about. And that's why the law puts your spiritual life to death. So, uh, where are we at here? Wow. All right, so now what I want to do now is I want to talk about the different kinds of suffering. So I'm going to have to do these quickly. The first suffering is the suffering of this present time. I think everybody understands what that is. Those are the sufferings that happen to you whether you're saved or lost. They're not things that you plan on. You're sitting at a, a red light. The guy behind you is texting. He's not paying attention. He rear-ends you. Now you injured your neck and you got whiplash that that pain and suffering is part of the sufferings of this present time 
Satan didn't have him rear end you, and God did not orchestrate that either. That's what happens when you live in a fallen world. And a lot of the sufferings of this present time are really the result. You can trace most of that back to somewhere. In this case, it would be a guy texting instead of putting his eyes on the road. But it results in the suffering of this present time. And I think we all pretty much understand what that is. You've got a whole long uh, uh, deal about that in your notes. But I th we've covered it so many times, I think you get it. There's also a, a subcategory of that. It is the suffering of our own foolish mistakes. Sometimes we just do stuff that we knew better when we did it, but we did it anyway, and then we suffer the consequences of it. And you know what? Some, some of us take longer to learn than others. That's kind of a subcategory of that, but it's not really based on something someone else is doing. That's based on something we were doing. The next one is suffering that comes from the general policy of evil that is at work in this world. I didn't put it in your notes, but you might put Ephesians 2, 2 out beside that in your notes because the means by which God, I, I'm sorry, Satan is conducting his policy of evil today is through his course of this world, which he charted and he directs. And that's what he is using now to be a big influencer. When I say it's the general policy of evil, I mean, it's just kind of out there for everybody. It's not really directed against you personally unless you just happen to violate something about it and then you come under fire for that. And the, and the general policy of evil can be severe depending on when in history you lived and where you were in the world. It, it, it may just work out that way. But it is not directed at you individually, and it is not going to stop if you stop your sonship life. That is the thing that is moving through this world. The last category is the sufferings of Christ, and that is the individualized, progressive, from mild to worst, attacks of the adversary. And those attacks are designed to make you stop your sonship life. And if you do, those attacks will go away. You'll still have the sufferings of this present time. You'll still suffer from your own stupid mistakes. And you'll still have the general policy of evil. But you won't have that one. And so just saying, those are the four areas. And why in the world do we need to know those? Because knowing why people are suffering sometimes helps us minister to them more effectively. So if you can identify that of what's happening with someone, I think it helps you know uh, how to discharge that office of mercy. Um, and, and, and so, now that's not everything I have to say about that, but again, we've been through the sufferings of Christ before, and I've given you pretty complete notes about that for what we need to understand this time. And so now what we have done in this first form of doctrine in Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 8, is that w we have begun to learn some doctrine that will actually help us and can be applicable when others are suffering. But there is also doctrine that, in fact, let me just say it this way. There's two great resources, two great resources. When you are, when you are suffering, there is one that resource that you will employ yourself, and that is the doctrine that you have learned up to that point. The second great resource is your fellow saints as they operate out of the office of mercy. Those, on, I, I, let me be honest with you, I, and okay, I don't even know why you say that. It gets in your vocabulary. It kind of implies everything else wasn't. Um, I, if someone were to say to me, that doesn't look like much, I understand why they would say that. And I'm going to tell you why. Because churches, by and large today, don't have either one of those issues up and running in them properly. If they were, 
you would see them for the large resources that they really are. And that's what I'm hoping to pull back the curtain on and allow us to see. They, this doctrine is of such importance. i will show you this verse. I know the buzzer went off, but I got, I got, I got to keep going. 2 Corinthians 12, 10. Paul says this. Therefore, By the way, do you understand what was happening prior to this? He had a thorn in the flesh. He prayed three times for God to remove it. God says what? My grace is sufficient for you. When Paul learns that, look what he says he is now going to do. Therefore, because God says my grace is sufficient, when you're weak, I'm strong. Does Paul want the power, the excellence of the, the, excellency of, of the power, which is of God, to be at work in him? He does. And so he says, therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities that's physical things in reproaches we know what that is he's being disliked in necessities he's doing without in persecutions now they're really trying to get rid of in distresses for Christ's sake for when I am weak then am I strong he's got a whole list here that says from now on I'm going to take pleasure in those why because Paul likes pain? No. Because Paul realizes that something is happening in him as he responds to the doctrine positively and properly. Something of eternal value that cannot be gotten any other way is taking place in his inner man. And what's happening in him is the only thing he's taken with him when he goes. And that is important to him. By the way, that's where the doctrine can take you. We are not there yet. We're in Romans 12, 8. This is 2 Corinthians 12. But there is going to come a time when you're going to look at the sufferings and you are going to be able to take pleasure in what is being produced in your inner man in the midst of that. But you can't fake that and just hope it happens that's a real process that we engage in. And by the way, I'm going to take you through this process. And it starts in Romans 8. And everybody that's on Zoom, that's been following us along and is in this group and up in Glen Rose, you've all been through Romans 8. So you already know the doctrine that, that gets that generated. It hasn't come to its fullness yet. but you already, And I'm going to walk us through how to use that doctrine. So those are those two resources that we have there. So let's talk about the doctrine here. What is the benefit of the doctrine? Well, first of all, you know that uh, if you have a physical malady, the doctrine will not take away the pain. If, if you break a bone, the doctrine will not heal the, 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 the break. If someone is upsetting you, the doctrine will not solve the relationship. Not this doctrine that we're talking about. But what it will do is keep us, and I'm going to give you a list of them here. And maybe I've got them on the PowerPoint. No, I guess I don't. They will keep you from being overwhelmed by the physical sufferings that come your way. And by the way, those physical sufferings can be pretty severe. And they can be severe because of one of two things. Number one, they keep up over a long, protracted period of time. And while you might be able to deal with it for a while, when it just keeps going and just keeps going, it is very difficult to deal with. The second reason that those physical sufferings can be tough is because sometimes, instead of getting better, they get worse. And that is a little bit demoralizing. And you really need the doctrine to keep from being overwhelmed by physical sufferings that you feel like are too much for you to deal with. Now, again, I'm going to give you the practical step-by-step -step of how to do that. But um, I do want to answer this question. If, if God is really, if he really cares about us, and he really cares about what's going on with us, then why doesn't he just heal us 
or change the situation that's causing us so much misery? There's several answers to that. In today's lesson, I only want to say two things about that. Number one, the number one thing that God is doing with us today is working in our inner man to edify us unto godliness. And that process takes place, as you know, as we take those forms of doctrine and we respond positively and properly to them so that that edification takes place in us so that when we encounter those things, we get focused on something else instead of the problem. Now, look, if you're suffering in some way and you can solve it, then solve it. I often say if you slam your hand in the car door, don't just stand there going, I'm just going to suffer for Jesus here. Just open the door, and pull it out. But there's plenty of things that will happen in your life in which you cannot fix so easily. The second thing I want to say about that is because no one gets edified by that instant miraculous healing of God's omnipotent power. If you broke your arm and God healed it instantly for you or, or some other illustration that you could imagine, then you know what? There would be no grace working in your inner man. But if you break your arm or you're in some kind of a, a accident and you're injured, guess what? There is time. It takes time. And that is time that you can be relying on the doctrine to do this work in your inner man until the day that you get well. Until the, get, the day it doesn't hurt anymore. And you should take advantage of that. Even if you undergo surgery or under some kind of medical care, then until you get better, you should implement that doctrine and let it do in your inner man what it's designed to do. The second thing is, the doctrine will keep you from being overwhelmed by mental and emotional sufferings. You can imagine what those might be. They might be because of some situation in your life, or they might be the loss of a loved one that for some people seems like it may be too much to handle. The doctrine can't change the situation, but it will. So look, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to coin this phrase, and I want everybody to kind of get it in their mind. The doctrine is armor for your inner man, your soul and spirit. It's what's protecting you on the inside. It won't do anything about keeping you out of the car wreck, but all that pain and suffering that you have to go through afterwards, it will keep that from destroying you. The doctrine can give us a peace that keeps our hearts and minds in the midst of terrible sufferings. We'll have opportunity to come back and take a look at these verses in detail. But Philippians 4, 7 is the verse I have in mind. By the way, I, I skipped this thing in Colossians. I didn't mean to. But when Paul said I, that he rejoices in his sufferings, for the Colossians and for the body of Christ and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ and my flesh for his body's sake. In other words, Paul knew that by going through these things, he was serving as an ensample to the rest of the body of Christ so they would know how to go through it without being overwhelmed by them. And so I just wanted to mention that. So now let me take you to this next one, Philippians 4, 7. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And that word keep, when you look at that, it means to guard. In, this, in the context that he's talking about here, he's talking about guarding your hearts and minds so that you don't get destroyed and overwhelmed by the things that you're going through. That's a big deal. That is a big deal. And so that doctrine is something that we really have to depend on. The last thing I'll say about it is the doctrine allows us to look at our suffering situation from our Heavenly Father's point of view. By not focusing on our circumstance of suffering, but focusing on our response to it. And it should be a godly response. 
And so if we're going to do that, then, and, and by the way, when those things happen, our knee-jerk reaction is too many times not to think of that doctrine. Instead, uh, we kind of lose the opportunity to suffer with him. So look, in Romans 8, 17, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs of Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, we, we forget that here is an opportunity, even though it may be temporary, to actually suffer with him which has a direct impact on our joint heir inheritance. How about 2 Corinthians 4.18? While we, and this, I, I love this because Paul knows where the focus is supposed to be. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And those are the inner man things. And Paul says, don't get focused on this thing that's going on out here. Appeal to the doctrine so that your focus will be on what's going on in your inner man. And look, for most things, eventually they will go away. And when they do, and your situation changes, then great. But you utilize the doctrine until that happens. There are a few things for some people, maybe not everybody, that will never change and never go away. But if you're responding to this properly out of the doctrine, it won't matter. Because now you understand what is being accomplished in your inner man in the midst of that. I'm not saying anybody will say, I really love suffering but you really will love the life of Jesus Christ being made manifest in you. That is the critical difference of that. And so I wanted to end this because in this 2 Corinthians 4.18, if you back up in that chapter and look at this chapter, there's some things that Paul says here. Just take a look at this. He received mercy as he conducted his ministry so that he fainted not because there were things that Otherwise, might have caused Paul uh, to quit. And um, I don't want to read the whole chapter, but look, that's verse 1. In verse 7, he talks about the excellency of the power of God being made manifest in us. I referred to that to you a while ago. I just wanted to bring it up. Verse 8, he said, I'm tr well, I got the whole deal there, don't I? Troubled on every side. <laughs> Troubled on every side and perplexed and persecuted and cast down and bearing about in his body the dying of the Lord Jesus which by the way is what it means to suffer with him and being all way I don't know why that autocorrect kept putting that S in there I deleted it twice all way delivered unto death our, he talks about our outward man perishes our afflictions work an eternal weight of glory and then that last verse that we had was we don't look we don't look at I'm trying to get down here where it is we don't look at those things, but we look at the life of Jesus being manifest in our mortal flesh. And that's the unsearchable riches. That's Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the mystery of godliness. That's the inner man work. Now, I've said all of this to try to bring our thinking back around to just how big a deal that is. I haven't even talked about this one yet. But you want me to tell you how big a deal this is? Because when you're suffering, I'm going to show you doctrine that you're going to begin to rely on that one day is going to produce the same mindset that was in Paul. What is going to happen here? How big a deal is that? The fellow saints, what is it that is supposed to motivate us to be merciful and comforting to our fellow saints? The love that we have for them, right? That godly love and charity. How big a subject is that in your Bible? When you start looking at the number of verses that talk about that, and you see how big that is, now you understand how big that office of mercy is. These are huge resources, and they are meant for our benefit. I am hoping that you will see that. Now, 
what do we do then with those verses that seem to indicate that Paul is praying and asking others to pray with him about some outward circumstances? Those are fair questions, and they deserve answers. And so we're going to be looking at those. Obviously, not today. I'm already over, I don't know, by a while. But we're going but. And, but we're going to examine those. I'm not going to leave those alone or act like they're not there. I want us to have a real understanding of what we should expect us to be able to pray for and what are we expecting God to do when we do that. So I'm going to give you to the best of my ability my understanding of all of those things. Every one of us will be persuaded in our own mind what we're going to do about that. And so I can appreciate that. That, I, I, to, to, Two other things on the back of your notes. I kind of covered them in a couple of sentences, so I'm not going to go to the trouble to just reel them off here. Uh, but look, we will have a word of prayer, though, and we'll stop and take a break, and then we'll come back for the interactive session. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness to us, and it really is goodness. You are being long-suffering in this dispensation of grace, and you're giving men an opportunity to be saved. At the same time, you're giving us saints the opportunity to be edified unto godliness. And we understand that that edification takes place in our inner man, and it takes place by a prescribed means that is uh, outlined in your word that is contained in those forms of doctrine that are there in the book of Romans, and that that's not going to happen any other way. But we're glad for that because we believe you have put this together in your wisdom and in your understanding, that you didn't forget anything or leave something out or overlook some detail or that you have somehow shortchanged us in this process. But like our apostle, our heart's desire is for Christ to be formed in us so that we can truly think, live, and labor like our Father. And we do all of that to His glory. And we're grateful to be able to study this Word and know that when we respond to it rightly, that it has the ability to effectually work in our inner man and accomplish those very things in us. And we thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen.